Hello, friends. Welcome to Thinking on Scripture. My name is Stephen Cook. Today we're picking up in our next lesson in our series on the subject of soteriology. Soteriology is the study of salvation. It derives from two Greek words, soter, which means savior, and logos, which means a study of or a word about something. And uh, so we are currently working through biblical terminology related to soteriology. Uh, as usual, I will post a link in the description below for any of you that would like to have access to my study notes. They are available in PDF format. And uh, I would recommend downloading the most current version because I have made some uh, modifications since uh, my last lesson. So if you'd like to follow along, be sure to download the most current version. Now, in today's lesson, we're going to talk about the subject of grace, which is a very, very important subject uh, as it appears, uh, especially as it's related to the subject of soteriology. Now, grace is seen throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Hebrew noun chen appears 69 times, and according to James Swanson, and here I'm going to be citing him from his uh, book, Dictionary of Biblical Languages with Semantic Domains. He says that hen means grace, kindness, kind-heartedness, compassion, i.e. acts of kindness, which benefit the object of pleasure. Which benefit the object of pleasure. Uh, and so the word Chen, the noun, uh, is used of God, it's used of people, and sometimes refers to an attractive quality, such as one's speech. Now, when it's used of God, I think of Genesis 6, 8, which says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, in the context here, God is pronouncing judgment upon the earth. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But verse 8 stands out. It says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, this within the context of judgment. Uh, I have a quote from uh, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. This is taken from his commentary on Genesis, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. He says, Nevertheless, a Genesis 6, 8 moves from a negative to a positive, from the judgment of God to the grace of God. He says, the grace of God was present contemporaneously with the judgment of God. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Jehovah. He found grace in the eyes of God. Fruchtenbaum uh, closes out. He says, this was the way out of the devastation. This is grace in the context of judgment. He says, the word found shows grace is not won and it is not earned. Noah simply found grace in God, end quote. I thought that was pretty insightful because I think he's correct on that. So again, when we look at the use of the Hebrew noun chen, it is used of God. Uh, in fact, over in Exodus thirty-three seventeen, it says, The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, for you have found favor in my sight. So, again, it speaks of, it, it, it is referred to God, uh, who uh, displays grace. It is also used of people, Genesis thirty-four eleven. It says, Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, If I have found chen, favor, in your sight, then I will give you uh, whatever you say to me. Or you see it like over in Genesis 39, verses 3 and 4. It says, Now his master saw that the Lord was with him. This is going to be uh, Joseph, <clears throat> excuse me, when he was in, uh, in jail. Joseph, when he was in jail. It says, Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor. And there's our word, uh, chen. There's the use of the Hebrew noun there. 
It says that he found favor in his sight, that is, in the sight of this other person. And so again, the word is used of God, and it is used of people. And sometimes it refers to an attractive quality uh, that you see in a person, such as speech. For example, over in Psalm 45, verse 2, it says, You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Grace is poured upon your lips with the idea that uh, what is said is attractive. Proverbs 22, 11 says, he who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious, the king is his friend. And there we see again the use of the Hebrew noun, chen. Uh, So it refers here in these contexts to to an attractive quality, such as speech. We also find the Hebrew verb chanan, uh, which appears about 80 times And according to Hallett, which is the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, it means merciful, kind, and gracious. Now, Hanan here uh, is translated gracious. You see it like in the name Yohanan, or we think of like John the Baptist, but John translates Yohanan. And when you see that Yo on the beginning of that, that is a reference to Jehovah or Yahweh. Uh, And you see that sometimes in names. Um, like Isaiah, the Yah there is for Yahweh, or um, uh, or sometimes you also see it like with El, because like El is a another uh, uh, name for God, Elohim, and so you see it like in Daniel, E L at the end, God is my judge, or Ezekiel, you know, you see it there as well. But Hanan appears like in the name Yochanan, which means Jehovah is gracious, or uh, Yahweh is gracious. Anyway, just a little on the side there. Uh, but again, the Hebrew verb chanan appears about 80 times, and according to Hallett, means merciful, kind, gracious. Now, this characteristic is used both of God and people. So God is said to be gracious. Notice Ezekiel 34, 6. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious. And, uh, and there we see the use uh, here of Hanan. Um, we also see Psalm 86, verse 15, But you, O Lord, are God merciful and gracious. Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Uh, the word is also used with reference to people. It's used with reference to people. So like in Psalm 23, 7, the wicked borrows and does not pay, but the righteous is gracious and gives. Notice the righteous is gracious and gives. Uh, Psalm 112, verse 5, it is well with the man who is gracious and lends. He will maintain his cause in judgment. Now the verb commonly refers to the favor that one person extends to another, when it is not deserved or expected. I have a quote here by Merrill F. Unger, and this is taken uh, from the Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words, uh, and Unger was uh, one of the chief editors for that. He says, uh, Hanan may express, generos- may express generosity, a gift from the heart. God especially is the source of undeserved favor, and he is asked repeatedly for such gracious acts as only he can do, end quote. And Unger here references two passages. One is in Numbers 625. It says, the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And then over in Genesis 4329, uh, where it says, and he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. This is Joseph speaking here. And he said, is this your youngest brother of whom you said to me? And he said, may God be gracious to you, my son. So uh, just some interesting passages there. But I'm just simply pointing out a few passages that demonstrate that uh, grace or graciousness uh, are qualities to be seen uh, primarily in God, which is important for us in the study of soteriology, but also with people. Now, jumping into the New Testament, the Greek word charis, charis, that's C-H-A-R-I-S, 
And that word comes into the English uh, for like the word charisma or charismatic. And, and we think of somebody who has an attractive uh, personality, a, a quality about them that draws people to them. And so they're said to have charisma. Uh, and that's where that word comes from. It refers to that attractiveness. Now, we saw that in the Old Testament where language uh, can be gracious. It can be attractive. Well, that's also true in the New Testament as well. So the Greek word kadis appears 155 times in the New Testament. And it is most commonly translated as grace or favor. I think of John 1.14, John 1.14, which says, And the Word, that's the second member of the Trinity, God the Son, and the Word became flesh uh, and dwelt among us, that is, at the time of the Incarnation, when he added humanity to himself. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of chadis, full of grace and truth. And then over in Romans 4.4, uh, where it is translated as favor, it says, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. And so here it's translated as favor. Now the word is also used to express thanks. Now what I'm doing here is I'm looking at various passages where the word appears in the New Testament, and context always determines the meaning of a word. Context always determines the meaning of a word. And so we see, like in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, uh, where Paul says, But thanks be to God. And there we see uh, the use of the uh, word kadis there. Also over in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Again, kadis there being an expression of gratitude. The word can also refer to uh, somebody who has an attractive quality about them. Uh, and we saw this in the Old Testament. Well, that's also true in the New Testament. Here this speaks of Jesus, and it says, And all were speaking well of him, and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And so they, there was an attractive quality uh, about Jesus when he spoke, uh, when he spoke truth, when he, when he spoke the scriptures, uh, that there was something attractive about him and, and the graciousness of his words. Paul says in Colossians 4, 6, here speaking to the Christians at Colossae, he says, let your speech always be with grace. Let it be with grace, as though uh, let it have an attractive quality about it. Now, Paul, and this is interesting because out of the 155 times that the word kadis is used in the New Testament, uh, Paul uses the word 130 times. And so out of those 155 times, the Apostle Paul gobbles up that word 130 times. You see, and that right there tells you that Paul is a grace man. Now, uh, I have a definition here, and this is taken from Badag, the Bauer, Danker, Arndt, and Gingrich, a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other, Christian, other early Christian literature, uh, page 1079. Uh, they say grace refers to a beneficent disposition towards someone, favor, grace, gracious care, help, or goodwill, end quote. Now, this definition speaks of the attitude of one who is characterized by grace, now, a gracious act, and here uh, I'm citing from Badag as well, a gracious act is, quote, that which one grants to another, the action of one who volunteers to do something not otherwise obligatory, end quote. And that captures, I think, really the heart of it. Uh, let me read that again. That which one grants to another, the action of one who volunteers to do something not otherwise obligatory, end quote. Now, Jesus is an example of grace in that he cared for others. Uh, we know in the New Testament that he healed and fed many. Uh, we also know that he did this even to those who refused to show gratitude to him. I have a passage here in Luke chapter 17, which I'll chase down. And it says here, and he entered a village, uh, as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And so here you have these ten lepers, and they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, noticed they were cleansed. So this is a divine healing from Jesus to these ten lepers. But notice verse 15, it says, Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Uh, and he said, stand up, go. Uh, he said, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Well, here Jesus heals the ten, but did Jesus know from his omniscience that only one was going to return? Well, the answer is yes. And yet he healed them because of who he is and not because of the attitude or the response of those of, who received the healing. So again, Jesus is an example of grace in that he cared for others, healing and feeding many, even to those who refused to show gratitude. And he acted out of his own goodness for the benefit of others. With a full knowledge, the majority would reject him and abuse his kindness. In fact, there's two passages that stand out to me in the New Testament. One is in John 3.19, most particularly in the Gospel of John. It says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. That, uh, that here is this perfect display of light, of truth uh, in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the God-man, the theanthropic person. And so even though it says that the light has come into the world, it says men love the darkness rather than the light. And so at the heart of every problem is really the problem of the heart. And for many people, they love the darkness rather than the light. Uh, but this did not stop Jesus from coming into the world and being the light. John twelve thirty seven says, But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. But even though they did not believe in him, this did not stop Jesus from performing his signs. Now, others may not understand or accept what is offered by grace. But this is not for want of a gracious attitude or action on the part of the giver, where the benefactor freely confers a blessing upon another, and the kindness shown find its source in the bounty and free-heartedness of the giver. Now let me say that again. Others may not understand or accept what is offered by grace. Uh, But again, uh, this lack of understanding, this is not for want of a gracious attitude. Uh, or action on the part of the giver, where the benefactor freely confers a blessing upon another, and the kindness shown finds its bounty uh, in the in, finds its source in the bounty and free heartedness of the giver. And so, grace is really an expression of the person who is giving. It is in no way predicated upon the beauty or worth of the object especially us as the recipients of God's grace, because we were not attractive, we are not attractive, and we will not be attractive. But God loves us and God is gracious to us because of who he is and not because of who we are. Now, once grace is received by a person, once it is received by a person, it can in turn lead to gracious acts to others. It can. And in this way, grace leads to grace, because as one is the recipient of God's grace, uh, that can lead to a gracious attitude uh, towards others who don't deserve the kindness that is extended to them. And of course, the greatest expression of grace is observed in the love of God, uh, in the love that God shows toward undeserving sinners for whom he sent his son to die in their place so that we might have eternal life. You see, and this is where grace comes into focus on the subject of soteriology, because we do not earn uh, or deserve God's love towards us in any way. 1 John 3, 1 says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we, uh, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. And of course, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. 
And he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so here we see where God's love is a reflection of who he is, and again, is not predicated in any way on the beauty or worth of the object. Uh, Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And here is a display of grace uh, in that we do not earn or deserve the love of God in any way. But again, this is born out of the bounty and goodness uh, of the giver. And again, is in no way predicated upon the beauty or worth of the object. Now, the reality is, is that everyone needs grace. Everyone needs grace. And this because we are all born in sin. We are all born in sin, and none of us can save ourselves, none of us can redeem ourselves from the slave market of sin to which we are all born. Biblically, we are said to be sinners in Adam. We are sinners by nature, that is, we have a proclivity to sin, and we are also sinners by choice. Now, Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden is the first and greatest of of them all. Because of Adam's rebellion against God, sin and death entered into the human race, and death spread throughout, really, the entire universe. And all of Adam's descendants are born into this world spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, 1 says that we are born, he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Uh, Ephesians 2, 3 uh, says that we were by nature children of wrath. And here he's talking to believers, but he's talking about their life prior to coming to faith in Christ, that you were by nature, by nature, children of wrath. And Ephesians 2, 12 says that we were separate from Christ, having no hope and without God in the world. Colossians 1, 21 says that we were alienated from God. Uh, Romans 5, 6 through 10, there's four words that pop in that uh, passage there, where Paul says, for while we were still helpless, that's the first word, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Uh, Notice that Christ did not die for the deserving, for the worthy, for the good, for the moral. Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. And so we can understand that on a human level, where he says one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, uh, someone would dare even to die. One can understand dying in the place of, of a good person so that they can continue on in their goodness. But uh, that speaks of the human level. So you have the righteous and you have the good. And Paul elevates those two. But In verse 8, he says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, we're not righteous, we're not good, uh, we're 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 on the bottom rung, we're in the bottom category. And so God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So again, these four words that appear there uh, just pop off the page, that we are said to be helpless, we are said to be ungodly, we are said to be sinners, and we are said to be enemies of God. And yet, even while we were in this very, very unattractive state, God sent his Son into the world to die for us, that he demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, that's grace, because we don't earn or deserve that. Now, from a biblical perspective, we are all born totally depraved. Now, my uh, Calvinist friends would say that total depravity means total inability, uh, that one cannot in and of themselves respond to God or to the offer of salvation. Now, they also believe that there is a limited elect uh, that God has selected out of the human race to be saved. They hold to limited limited atonement that Christ died only for the elect. Uh, But they argue logically that God must regenerate a person, that is, make them spiritually alive, regenerate them, that God gives them a special kind of faith, a gift of faith, 
uh, and then they can exercise that gift of faith to believe in Christ uh, because they believe that man is totally unable to respond to God in and of uh, himself or herself. Now, I find that not to be uh, accurate biblically because it puts the cart before the horse in the Ordo Salutis. It puts regeneration preceding faith. Uh, But this is according to the logic of their system, and they're just being consistent in their logic. The problem is is that uh, the way that they define total depravity I don't think has uh, good biblical support. Total depravity, uh, and I use the term total depravity, I think it's a fine term, but total depravity does not mean total inability. Uh, Total depravity means that sin permeates every aspect of our being, our intellect, our will, our emotions. It it, it impacts every part of us, and so it, uh, it extends to every part of who we are. I have a quote here from Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, and this is taken from his Systematic Theology, Volume 7. Uh, page 118 and 19, he says, quote, Theologians employ also the phrase total depravity, which does not mean that there is nothing good in an unregenerate person as seen by himself or by other people. It means that there is nothing in fallen man which God can find pleasure in or accept, end quote. So again here, he says total depravity means uh, that there is nothing in fallen man which God can find pleasure in or accept. And that's correct, because when we think about what the Bible has to say about mankind, it's, it's not a pretty picture. Now, we are made in the image of God, and we are fallen. We are fallen, that's true. We are trapped in Satan's slave market of sin, and we are said to be helpless, uh, ungodly, sinners, and enemies of God. The Scripture does not give a flattering view of us at all. So in the sense of how the divine viewpoint estimation of humanity goes, uh, there's nothing in fallen man which God can find pleasure in or accept, and that's correct. So total depravity means we are corrupted by sin and completely helpless to save ourselves. That is, good works, the production of our good works has no saving value. Now, we can come and we can, uh, when we hear the gospel, we can exercise our faith and believe in Christ, and be saved. Now, God's grace uh, does not ignore righteousness or judgment. And here's where we kind of have to think in a very nuanced way. Uh, So God's grace does not ignore righteousness or judgment. God is righteous, and he must condemn sin. Now, he can either condemn it in the sinner or in a substitute. But we should understand that God must deal with sin. I have a quote here from Unger, and this is taken from the New Unger's Bible Dictionary, uh, page 504. He says, quote, Since God is holy and righteous, and sin is a complete offense to him, his love or his mercy cannot operate in grace until there is provided a sufficient satisfaction for sin. This satisfaction makes possible the exercise of God's grace, end quote. In other words, because God has dealt with our sin, because he has righteously judged our sin, and he judged it in Christ, and this is where the cross becomes so beautiful, because we cannot save ourselves. We cannot bring ourselves to God. We stand guilty before a righteous and a holy God. And God can either judge uh, our sin in us, the offender, or he can judge it in a substitute, which is what the cross is about. Because the Father sent his Son into the world, and and the Son came into the world and took upon himself humanity. This happened nearly 2,000 years ago. And he came into this world and was born of a virgin. That's called Parthenogenesis. And, uh, And so he came into this world minus Adam's original sin. There was no sin nature that was imputed to him because he was without a biological father. Joseph was his legal father, but not his biological father, because Jesus was supernaturally conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And, uh, and so the sin nature and Adam's original sin is passed on from the father to the child. And so this is why Jesus could be born or conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, who was herself a sinner in need of a Savior. But Jesus could be supernaturally conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, Uh, minus a sin nature. And you can read about that in Luke uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 26 and following, I think is correct. 
but Jesus came into the world minus a sin nature, and he went his entire life and committed no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 4.15, 1 Peter 2.22, and 1 John 3.5 all make that very clear. And so he went to the cross and he died. He did not die for his own sin. Uh, and he willingly went to the cross. John 10, 18, Jesus said, No man takes my life from me, but I lay it down. And so he went to the cross and he laid down his life and he died a death he did not deserve. And all of our sin was taken and was placed upon him on the cross. And he was judged for the sin of everyone. That's called unlimited, unlimited atonement. And so Jesus died for everyone. And so salvation is available to all, to, to every single person. Uh, that if they are positive to God and they want to know God, God will send them gospel information. And, uh, and so when they hear the gospel, they have that opportunity to believe in him. And once they believe in Christ, then the benefits of the cross, the wonderful benefits of the cross, are then applied to that person. And that includes several things. It includes subtraction of sin, Acts 10.43, uh, Ephesians 1.7. It includes the gift of righteousness, uh, John 10, 28. It includes the gift of righteousness, Romans 5, 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Philippians 3, 9. And so it includes many, many blessings uh, that brings us into a, a right standing before God. Again, not because of anything we do, but because of what Jesus did on the cross for us nearly 2,000 years ago, because he brought about our salvation. It was what he did. Salvation is never what we do for God. Never. At all. Salvation is what God has done for us through the work of Christ on the cross, who died in our place, who died a penal substitutionary death. Penal, he bore the penalty for our sins. Substitutionary, he died in our place. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us that Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. So that he might bring us to God, because we cannot bring ourselves to God. And we are reconciled and brought to God through the blood of Christ, through the death of Christ, because we cannot save ourselves. And so it's what Christ accomplished for us, but at the moment of faith in Christ, the benefits of the cross are applied to us. Not only do we receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life and the gift of righteousness, but we also are transferred from Satan's domain of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son, Colossians 1.13. Uh, uh, John 1.12 and Galatians 3.26 says that we become children of God. Uh, and so we are reconciled to God, uh, Romans 5.1, that we have peace with God. We have peace with God, and that is a relational peace with God. And this because of what Christ accomplished for us. Many, many wonderful blessings that we enjoy as Christians because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. But all the benefits of the cross are applied to us at the moment we trust in Christ as our Savior. That we trust in Christ and Christ alone. We do not look to ourselves. We do not look to anything we can do. We do not trust in anybody, in any organization, in any system. We reject it all. And we trust in Christ and Christ alone because man needs only Christ to be saved. No one else, nothing more, just simply Christ. And we trust in him. And see, we understand the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the good news. And what's the good news? That Christ died for us, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he was seen by many. And because of what he accomplished at the cross, he defeated sin and death. And so when we understand that, we can then, after hearing the gospel, the good news, we can then turn to Christ as the one who conquered sin and death, and we can believe in him. And that's why in Acts 16.30, when the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The answer came back with a very simple, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And so to trust in Christ means that we, uh, to, to be saved means that we trust in Christ uh, and we trust in Christ alone. And so to believe in Christ uh, means that, that we look to what he did for us and not what we can do for him. 
And so we turn from ourselves, we turn from every system or anything that we can do, and again, we trust in Christ and Christ alone. Uh, Acts 4.12 says that there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Uh, now going back to the notes here, uh, Christ is our substitute. He bore the penalty of all our sins and satisfied every righteous demand of the Father. 1 John 2.2 2 says that he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And propitiation there means satisfaction, that he himself is the satisfaction. In other words, what he accomplished on the cross satisfied every righteous demand of the Father. There's nothing more to be paid because Jesus paid it all. But he is not only the propitiation for our sins, but also for those of the whole world. You see, that's unlimited atonement, that Christ died for everyone. According to Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, and here I'm citing again from his Systematic Theology, Volume 7, page 178, he says, quote, Grace is what God may be free to do, and indeed what he does, accordingly for the lost, after Christ has died on behalf of them, end quote. So let me read that again. Grace is what God may be free to do, and indeed what he does, accordingly for the lost, after Christ has died on their behalf. So again, you have to keep God's righteousness and justice uh, in view. And because the righteous demands of God have been satisfied through the death of Christ, grace can now be poured out liberally upon uh, all humanity, but that must be received. It must be accepted by the lost. Now, God's love for sinners moved him to provide a solution to the problem, and that solution is Christ who died in our place. Now, once we have trusted in Christ for salvation and trusted in him alone, God then bestows on us several things. He bestows on us forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and many other blessings. Acts 10.43, it says, Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him, notice, receives forgiveness of sins. So everyone. That means the gospel is open to all. Everyone who believes in him, and that's all it takes, is simple faith alone in Christ alone. Everyone who believes in him at that moment, notice, receives, and this translates the Greek verb, lambano, which means to take, to receive. And so at that moment, at the moment of faith in Christ, we take possession or we receive at that moment forgiveness of sins. Now, forgiveness of sins is, uh, is one aspect of our salvation because it's not subtraction, it's also addition. It's also addition, but the forgiveness we have is a display of God's grace. Notice Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. Notice the forgiveness of, 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 our, of our trespasses, and notice according to the riches of his grace, according to the riches of his grace, we also receive eternal life. Jesus said, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and we receive many other blessings. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, epouranioi, in the heavenly places, in Christ. And I will deal with that prepositional phrase, in Christo, in a future lesson. But nonetheless, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, in Christ. Uh, now, for those who reject God's salvation by grace, they are left to trust in themselves and their own good works to gain entrance into heaven, and this will fail miserably for those who elect this course. And you see, they, they elect their own course. They, they choose this course. In the end, these will be judged by their works, and because their works never measure up to God's perfect righteousness, they will be cast into the lake of fire forever. Uh, Revelation 20 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it. And by the way, the great white throne judgment is for unbelievers only. No believer will be at this judgment. We will already be in heaven. So he says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. 
And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from these things which were written in the books, notice, according to their deeds. So these are going to be judged according to their works. Now, here's the problem. Uh, Good works do not save. They never have, and they never will. Only the work of Christ is what saves. Now, if you reject the work of Christ... Uh, then you are left to try to gain entrance into heaven by your own works. Uh, But good works don't save. And so human works never measure up to the perfect standard of God's righteousness. It, 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 It never has and never will. But these nonetheless are judged according to their deeds. It says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Notice verse 15. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, this is all avoidable. The lake of fire is absolutely avoidable if one will simply turn to Christ for salvation and believe upon him and trust him to do what we cannot do for ourselves to save us, because that's what salvation is. It's us trusting Christ to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves to save us. For if we could save ourselves, then Christ would have never had to have come and died. But his death is a testimony of the fact of this thing which we cannot do. The scripture is very clear, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, biblically, there is a common grace that God extends to everyone, whether they are good or evil. This is common grace, and you will find this taught in the Bible. God simply extends grace to all, and all receive it. Jesus said of the Father in Matthew Matthew, uh, 5.45, he says that he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so here God is extending grace to all humanity, to all humanity, that he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Very interesting passage over in um, uh, Acts chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, uh, the Apostle Paul says something similar here. It says, "In in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. Let me pause for just a moment there. This speaks of the sovereign will of God to permit people uh, to a course of action, that he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. It says, and yet he did not leave himself without a witness, in that he did good, notice, and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And so this is, um, this is God's common grace to all humanity. Now, in these passages, God's grace is freely given to all, and this because he is gracious by nature. However, there is a special grace given to those who will welcome it. Now, special grace refers to those blessings that God freely confers upon those who, in humility, turn to him in a time of need. The first uh, uh, form of special grace is saving grace. Uh, It's the saving grace that God provides for the lost sinner who turns to Christ in faith alone. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace caught us undeserved favor, unmerited kindness. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. And this salvation is the gift of God. It's the gift of God. Now, a gift by its very nature means that it was paid for by another person and is, and is offered freely without charge. There's no charge for it. If you have to pay for it, if you have to work for your salvation, it's not a gift. <laughs> but it is a gift. Paid in full. Very costly gift, too. Very costly. It cost God his son to go to the cross and to die for our sins. It's a very, very costly gift. But it is nonetheless the gift of God, not as a result of works. Not as a result of works. It's not as the result of works. Highlight that. Underscore that. Little asterisks around that. Little arrows pointed to it. It's not as a result of works so that no one may boast. So first, the the first kind of special grace is the grace that God extends and gives to those who trust in Christ alone for salvation. 
Second, there is what is called growing grace, and this is for the humble believer who studies and lives God's Word. 2 Peter 3.18, Peter says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, we need grace after salvation because we still retain our sin nature. Uh, it, uh, it has been crippled. It does, no longer has the tyrannical power uh, that it had prior to uh, our, being born, our being born again. <clears throat> and so we do fail. And uh, we, we continue to sin as believers. Uh, as we advance spiritually, we will sin less, but we will never reach a place of sinlessness that is not uh, taught in the Bible. And so we need grace. We need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And both are true. Both are true. Now, third, there is a grace that God gives, which is a divine enablement to help a believer cope with some life stress. Paul, when facing a difficulty, cried out to the Lord when he talks about his thorn in the flesh. He cried out to the Lord. In fact, verse 8 says that. He says, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Now, it is fine to pray for God to take away something. That's absolutely fine. But what God does not remove, he intends for us to deal with. And there's a reason for that, and that's in his wisdom. And so God says no to Paul. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And so grace here refers to a divine enablement that God gives to Paul to cope with this uh, pressure that is in his life, that's in his life. Uh, So humility and positive volition are necessary requisites for those who would receive God's special grace. As 1 Peter 5, 5 tells us that God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, in the context of 1 Peter 5, he's talking to believers. So when he says God is opposed to the proud, he's talking about the proud believer. Uh, to the proud believer, he says, but God gives grace to the humble, that is to the humble believer, to cope with those pressures of life. Now, as I mentioned earlier, God's saving grace is never cheap. It's never cheap. Our salvation is very costly. Jesus went to the cross and died in our place and bore the punishment that rightfully belongs to us. He is righteous. We are lost sinners. And he paid our sin debt in full. And there's nothing for us to add to what he accomplished at the cross. The sole condition of salvation is to believe in Christ as our Savior, That's the sole condition, faith alone in Christ alone. He died for us. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. And as Romans 6, 9 tells us, that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Now, salvation is not Jesus plus anything we do. It's Jesus alone. He saves Now, if we want to talk about any contribution we have to the cross, uh, we could really only put two things. We could put that our contribution to the cross was sin and death. That was our contribution. (laughs) So we gave nothing attractive to the cross. He took our sin upon himself, and he died. He bore the punishment that rightfully belonged to us. So Jesus took our sin upon himself and died in our place. Again, as I mentioned earlier, 1 Peter 3.18 which says that Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. Why? So that he might bring us to God, so that he might bring us to God, because we can't bring ourselves. We are brought to God solely by the death of Christ. He shed, his shed blood on the cross made the way possible. Salvation is never what we do for God. Rather, it's what he's done for us again through the cross of Christ. And all of this is consistent with the character of God, for the scripture reveals that he is gracious by nature. Uh, Exodus 34, 6 says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in, loving, in, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And Psalm 86, uh, verse 15 says, You, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. And 1 Peter 5.10 tells us that God is described as the God of all grace. He's called the God of all grace. 
Hebrews 4.16 tells us that he sits upon a throne of grace. Now, prior to faith in Christ, it was a throne of judgment. Um, But once we have come to faith in Christ and receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life and the gift of righteousness, from then on, it is a throne of grace. And he is one who gives grace to the afflicted, according to Proverbs 3.34. And he provides salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Romans 3, 24 says that we are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, uh, which is in Christ Jesus. And, uh, and so Jesus himself, in John 1, 14, is said to be full of grace and truth. And in Hebrews 10, 29, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of grace, Now, in order for us to be reconciled to God, we must simply trust in Jesus as our Savior. That's all that's needed. We are saved by grace alone. That is, we don't earn it or deserve it. It is undeserved kindness. Uh, But we are saved by grace alone through faith alone. It is simply trusting in Christ alone as our Savior. Again, no one else, nothing more. And so we we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It is Christ who saves, not Christ plus me, anything I do. It is Christ alone. And so uh, I think of like Acts 4.12. It says, And there is salvation and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So when we trust in Christ as our Savior, we are forgiven all of our sins. We are given eternal life. And we receive the righteousness of God as a free gift, the righteousness of God as a free gift. And I will talk about that in future lessons. But that will finish out today's lesson on the subject of grace. Now, there's a lot more that could be said about grace, but I've tried to keep it focused uh, uh, to its relationship to soteriology, that is, to our study of salvation. So hopefully this has been a helpful lesson to you. I thank you very much for taking the time to watch this lesson, and I wish you a blessed day.